Okay, well, welcome back. We are continuing on with our series on the early SDA use of the word person and its variants. We're going to be looking at D. W. Hull. That's Daniel W. Hull today. Now, this is what we're doing. We're basically we're trying to get to the bottom of a very, very important subject known as the personality of God. And what that deals with is understanding what early SDAs meant when they said things like God is a person, God has a person, God has a personality, or God is a personality, God is not an impersonal being, or God is a personal being, that sort of thing. Now, we're doing this because of the fact that Ellen White identified the personality of God as a pillar of our faith. Okay, you can see right here, she mentions the personality of God as a pillar of our faith. And she says that when these pillars are being threatened, then the writings of the pioneers in our work should be reprinted. Their articles on these topics should be reprinted when these pillar doctrines are um, being threatened. Now, how were these pillar doctrines established in the first place? That's a really important question. It's a really good question. It's very, very important. This is Ellen White's description of how the pillars of our faith were established. We've covered this a little bit in some of our previous videos, but I'm going to do a fuller treatment of it uh, again today. And, you know, this might be the first time you've seen any of our videos on the early SDA use of person and its variants. And this is a really important aspect. So let's just go through this very quickly. It won't take very long. Ellen White wrote, My husband, Elder Joseph Bates, Father Pierce, Elder Edson, and many others who were keen, noble, and true, were among those who, after the passing of the time in 1844, searched for truth. At our important meetings, these men would meet together and search for the truth as for hidden treasure. I met with them, and we studied and prayed earnestly, for we felt that we must learn God's truth. Often we remained together until late at night, and sometimes through the entire night, praying for light and studying the word. As we fasted and prayed, great power came upon us, but I could not understand the reasoning of the brethren. My mind was locked, as it were, and I could not comprehend what we were studying. Now, again, this is how the pillars were established. Okay, so then she continues and she says, Then the Spirit of God would come upon me. I would be taken off in vision, and a clear explanation of the passages we had been studying would be given me with instruction as to the position we were to take regarding truth and duty. Again and again this happened. A line of truth extending from that time to the time when we shall enter the city of God was plainly marked out before me, and I gave my brethren and sisters the instruction that the Lord had given me. They knew that when not in vision, I could not understand these matters, and they accepted as light direct from heaven the revelations given me. Thus, the leading points of our faith as we hold them today, of course, that was written in 1903, so as they held them in 1903, thus, the leading points of our faith were firmly established. Point after point was clearly defined, and all the brethren came into harmony. Okay, now again, that's how the pillars were established, but this series is focusing on just one of those pillars. It's focusing on the personality of God. It's focusing on what do they mean by saying God is a person. Now, you might be wondering, okay, well, how important is this particular doctrine as compared with any of the others? And that's a fair question. It's a really, really good one. So here's the way Ellen White expresses the answer to that question. Um, it's not in direct response to someone asking her this question. That's not what I'm saying. But if we want to know how important is this particular pillar doctrine, this statement uh, made in 1903 explains how important it is. 
She said, you are not definitely clear on the personality of God, which is everything to us as a people. Okay, now, if we just change the color of some of those words there and just look at this part of that statement, the personality of God is everything to us as a people. That's how important this particular doctrine is. And in addition to it being very important, the fact that she says it is everything to us as a people, that showed that as a people, they had the truth on this topic. Of course, she already mentioned that in the statement that we saw just before this. She was mentioning um, the personality of God as one of the pillars of our faith. But something that is everything to us as a people, obviously, it's hard to get much more important than that, right? So anyway, um, we'll keep that in mind, or I would like for you to keep that in mind as we continue through looking at how D.W. Hull used the word person and its variants, because he was an early uh, convert to Seventh-day Adventism. Um, he became a Seventh-day Adventist in the 1850s. So here is a really short little article from the Review and Herald, June 2, 1859. And this is written from D.W. Hull. And he mentions here, he says, it has only been a short time since I could see any beauty in theology. The present truth, however, has had the effect of setting me to thinking. My mind is not barren as of old, the more I study God's word, the more I desire to study. I thank God that ever Brother Wagner and my brother Hull were sent here. So that was written in 1859. And at that time in June of that year, he had only been in the message for a short time. Now, just to put this in perspective, J.H. Wagner, one of the, the Brother Wagner there mentioned by Daniel Hull, J.H. Wagner had only been a Seventh-day Adventist since about the year 1851, so maybe seven to eight years earlier, which isn't a long time. So this is very early on in the movement, and um, people like Uriah Smith and J.N. Loughborough had only been in the movement since like 1852. So Anyway, he was one of the early ministers in the movement, and um, he was also, uh, from everything I could find, he was the first secretary of the Iowa Conference after the organization of the movement when it became known as the Seventh-day Adventist Church or denomination. So when he became a Seventh-day Adventist, when Daniel Hull became a Seventh-day Adventist, he had to learn the pillar doctrines of the faith uh, regarding the Sabbath, regarding the sanctuary, regarding the personality of God and of Christ. So what did he teach about the personality of God? What did he mean by saying God is a person or God has a personality or God is a personage or that sort of thing? So let's find out. Okay, now we're primarily, well, we're going to be looking at primarily two articles by D.W. Hall. Um, one of the articles, in fact, the one that we're looking at here, it was published in two parts. Um, most of it is from this issue of the Review and Herald, November 10, 1859, uh, volume 14, number 25. And then toward the end, we'll see it just a little bit from the next week, which would have been number 26, November 17, 1859. But we're going to start with this, and we're going to see how did he use the words person and its variants. Now, this isn't the whole article, and this isn't at the very beginning of the article. This is just, this is starting with paragraph nine, as you can see from the screen there in the quotes. So here's what he says. We might here add that the orthodox view of God, as expressed by them in several articles of faith, is that God is without body, parts, passions, center, circumference, or locality. 
the them there are the other non-SDA churches. And he specifically mentions the Methodist Episcopal Church, but um, he wasn't only focused on that. He goes on to say, it would be a very easy matter to prove that such a view is exceedingly skeptical, if not atheistical, in its nature. It certainly appears that such a God as this must be entirely devoid of an existence. The many scriptures opposed to this view ought, it would seem, to forever settle the matter. Now, let's pay attention first to what the several articles of faith mention about God, what the orthodox view or the commonly accepted view of God um, how it was expressed. In their Articles of Faith, it's expressed that God is without body, parts, passions, center, circumference, or locality. Now, next, he goes on to say that this view is not only exceedingly skeptical, but it's even atheistical in its nature. And if you hear a little bit of extra noise or if the sound quality of this recording isn't the best, I do apologize, but it's an extremely windy day today. And um, anyway, I will hopefully be able to cancel out much of the noise in uh, some editing process. But if you hear extra stuff, that's what's going on. Okay, so he says it's exceedingly skeptical, if not atheistical in its nature. And that it certainly appears that such a God as this, a God without a body, without body parts, without passions or emotions is what that means, um, without center, circumference, or locality. In other words, a God that isn't in one place at a time, has no definite location. A God like that must be entirely devoid of an existence. Okay, so then... He he says the many scriptures opposed to this view ought, it would seem, to forever settle the matter. So he's about to um, get into that a little bit. And I'm skipping some of what he says just because he doesn't use the word person in there and it's not adding anything to our investigation. But as usual, I will have links in the description. I encourage you to read the full article. It's very good. and. Um, you will learn a lot about what the early SDAs taught about the nature of God and the nature of Christ and his divinity. Okay, so there's a lot of important theological history there. Um, okay, but we'll continue on now with this. He says, by turning to Exodus 33, 20 to 23, the reader will observe that the Lord does not try to give Moses the impression that he is a bodiless personage, if the term is allowable, but, says he, thou canst not see my face. If ever the Lord would correct an error and deny his personality, we might expect it would be here. Okay, so... Exodus 33, verses 20 to 23, is one of the scriptures that he's referring to as being one of those scriptures that should forever settle the matter regarding whether or not God has a body and body parts, center, circumference, locality, etc. Now, in so doing, as he's talking about this passage, notice that he uses the term bodiless personage, but also notice that in parentheses, he adds, if the term is allowable. Now, what we learn from that is that this is a term that apparently isn't allowable. It's what you would say if you think this really isn't right. So a bodiless personage, there's an inherent contradiction there that makes it apparent that that term really shouldn't be used that way. But the idea is that that's what the Orthodox view of God promotes, that God is. That, I mean, Christianity promotes that God is a person, but it's taught that God is a bodiless person. And personage, um, the suffix there changes the word person to mean kind of like um, uh, an exalted person or an important person or a royal person 
that sort of thing. So he's saying that in Exodus 33, the Lord doesn't try to give Moses the impression that he is a bodiless personage. So we can see there by personage, if he was using a term that he thought was allowable, he would have said a bodily personage, right? Because mm, is the term really allowable, bodily personage? Okay. So then he goes on to say, if ever the Lord would correct an error and deny his personality, we might expect it would be here. Okay. So there's another variation of the word person, the word personality. The most common usage for the word personality is to um, use it in a way that's referring to someone's character traits or kind of like how how they behave or, or um, whether they have uh, a funny personality or a kind personality, congenial, you know, that sort of thing, character traits. But the other usage of the word personality refers to what we would say today more commonly um, it would be the word personhood. So personality, if you wanted to deny, or if God wanted to say, hey, I need to correct you. You have a little bit of an error here. You know, I don't have an actual body. That's where we might expect him to do that. If ever the Lord would correct an error and deny his personality, we might expect it would be here. So that shows that he is using the word personality to refer to his bod God's bodily form with body parts and all the rest of it. Now, he goes on to say, he, meaning God, he does not, however, tell him or tell Moses. God does not, however, tell Moses that he should not see his face because he had no face. Now, remember, he said, if ever the Lord would correct an error and deny his personality, you'd think it would be here. But he doesn't tell Moses that he shouldn't see his face because he had no face. See, that again, it shows us what he means by personality, because denying his personality is equated to denying that he has a face. That's what God would do if he was correcting an error and denying his personality, he would be like, look, I don't have a face. You can't see me because I don't have anything for you to see. So Hull goes on after saying he doesn't tell Moses that he shouldn't see his face because he had no face, but tells him that no man shall see him and live, which would imply that he was a personage having body and parts. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me. So he had a circumference, had he not? And I will take away my hand and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Okay, now notice where he says a personage having body and parts. That's a very clear example of what he means by personage. These passages where, in Exodus 33, specifically where um, God shows Moses his back and doesn't tell him, no, you can't see my face because I don't have a face. This implies, Hull is pointing out, that all of this, this conversation between God and Moses, it implies that God was a personage having body and parts. So what he means by personage is a being with a body and parts. Then another thing to notice is that he quotes again, and the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me. And then whole comments on that and says, so he had a circumference, had he not? In other words, if you are in a particular place and you're not just dispersed everywhere, then there is a point at which you stop, right? Like everything around me is my circumference. It's the outward edge, so to speak, of my general oval shape. And I can have things by me and they're not necessarily 
a part of me. They're just by me, right? So the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me. And D.W. Hall says, so he had a circumference, had he not? Then notice what else he points to. He quotes some more and it says, and I will take away my hand. Now this is God speaking. God's telling Moses, I will take away my hand and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Okay, so these are all showing us what D.W. Hole meant by saying God is a personage or um, God has a personality. He goes on to write, and this is just still continuing in order. He says, in Acts 7, 55 and 56, Stephen, while looking into heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And D.W. Hall has those italics there. He then says, um, and said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. This shows at least that God has a right hand. The very fact, however, of man's being created in the image of God ought to settle the matter forever with the candid. Okay, now he, again, like I said, he's the one that emphasized right hand of God. So that's what Stephen saw um, about the time he was being stoned to death. He looked into heaven. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And then D.W. Hall says, and this is really good. He says, this shows at least that God has a right hand. So this passage, of course, we saw in Exodus 33, Moses saw God's back, God's back parts. So in addition to God having a hand, God also has back parts, right? But he's just saying here in Acts 7, this shows at least that God has a right hand. But then he sums up here by saying, the very fact, however, of man's being created in the image of God ought to settle the matter forever with the candid. Now, the word candid there means honest. So for anyone who's honest, when... You know, if this is the point he's making for anyone who's honest, it should be forever settled that being created in the image of God shows that God has a body and parts. Okay. Now, we saw some of this from um, Uriah Smith in the last video. And here's just uh, one little slide from that. So if you haven't seen this video yet, I encourage you to go check it out. It's, um, it's also very good. He explains a lot about what he means by image, but also in the process, his article shows us what he meant by the word person and its variants. I'll have a card or a link in the description, wherever you're looking, um, wherever you're watching this video, you'll be able to find the link to that previous video very easily. Okay, now let's return to the very first slide we saw from this article by D.W. Hall. Now, remember here where he said it would be a very easy matter to prove that such a view of God, the view being God is without body parts, passions, center, circumference, or locality, that it would be very easy to prove that such a view is exceedingly skeptical, if not atheistical in his nature. Now, he actually, like four months earlier that same year, he had written another article that was published in the Review and Herald, where he, that's what he did. He was showing how the common view of God being without body parts, passion, circumference, center, locality, is the same as an atheistic view. Now, he's not the only one that talked about um, these atheistic views of God. Just before we move on to that other article by D.W. Hull, I'd like to share a couple of statements from Ellen White. Because again, remember, Ellen White said that she gave to the brethren and sisters the instruction that God had given her by divine revelation. And they accepted as light direct from heaven 
the visions given to her, the instructions given to her that she passed on to them and that they all were united on the truth. Then these earliest pioneers who already understood these pillar doctrines, when new people would come into the movement, they would learn from various ministers, um, preachers, or sometimes it would be from Ellen and James themselves. But very often it was people like um, Joseph Wagner, um, John Loughborough, and many others. I won't go through all the names, but these people are the ones who would go out and minister and preach and teach people and bring them into the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Well, they weren't Seventh-day Adventists officially prior to 1863, but they were Sabbath-keeping Adventists um, as early as 1846. Okay, so here's the statement from Ellen White, and this is in a letter written in 1903. She says, we are not to allow atheistic, spiritualistic sentiments to be brought before our youth. God has led us in the past, giving us truth, eternal truth. By this truth, we are to stand. Now she's pointing back to the establishment of the pillars of our faith. God has led us in the past, giving us truth, eternal truth. By this truth, we are to stand. Some of the leaders in the medical work have been deceived, and if they continue to hold fanciful spiritualistic ideas, they will make many believe that the platform upon which we have been standing for the past 50 years has been torn away. Now, before we move on, I just want to mention here that there was a platform upon which the SDAs had been standing for the past 50 years. So you take 50 off from 1903 and you get 1853, right? Now she wasn't, she said 50 years, you know, over a period of several years, she wasn't trying to give you a definitive date, 1853, because she said 50 years, even in 1905. This is generally speaking, it's been half a century. It's been 50 years, roughly. And this whole time, They've had this platform upon which they were standing. And it was um, eternal truth that God had placed them upon. God had given them this eternal truth. Now, just a bit earlier in this same letter, she also says, it is something that cannot be treated as a small matter that men who have had so much light and such clear evidence as to the genuineness of the truth we hold should become unsettled and led to accept spiritualistic theories regarding the personality of God. These doctrines, these spiritualistic doctrines, right? These doctrines followed to their logical conclusion, sweep away the whole Christian economy. Now, for her to say followed to their logical conclusion, she's not saying that they are logical. She's not saying these theories are logical. The point she's making is that if you follow the theories in a chain of logic, where do they lead? What is the conclusion if these premises were true? If these theories that some people were promoting at the time she was writing this if those theories were true, followed to their logical conclusion, it would sweep away the whole Christian economy. It would do away with God altogether. That's why they're atheistic spiritualistic sentiments, like we saw in paragraph nine on the slide previous to this. Okay, now we're going to take a look at D.W. Hull's article, wherein he shows that certain ideas about God are atheistic. They're the same as what, and now they use the term infidels a lot. And it, the term infidel might automatically come across as kind of like insulting today. Um, but it's the same as just saying someone who doesn't believe in God, right? An unbeliever. And um, it wasn't necessarily meant to be insulting or anything like that. But the title of his article, and this was July 7, uh, 1859, 
The title of its article is Similarity of the Doctrines of Modern Churches and Those of Infidels. Now, this is starting at the very beginning of his article, and we're not going to read the whole thing. We're just going to read a portion. He says, I hope the intelligent reader will not think for a moment that the following remarks were prompted by any ill feelings, whatever, towards any church, for it is not the case. While I love many persons now in mind who belong to churches which have articles of faith similar to those stated below, so we're going to get to that, right? Stated below, I regard them as deeply in error. So even though, like, he doesn't have anything personally against these people, he does regard them as deeply in error. Okay, fair enough. He goes on to say, the errors which I shall proceed to notice this time are the views entertained by several different denominations concerning God. And I am sorry that the views entertained by infidels on this point are so nearly similar to those entertained by Orthodox that there is no contrast between them. He goes on to say, the applicant for membership in one church is required to believe that God is without body or parts, circumference, center, or locality. The articles of faith of another denomination require us to believe, in addition to all this, that God is also without passions, so that he cannot even be compared to a stone or a block of wood. For while they lack the attribute of passions, they all have body, parts, circumference, center, and locality. Then he goes on to say, In the above description, the reader cannot fail to see a full description of nothing. Let us compare. Okay, now trying to describe nothing is kind of hard to wrap your mind around. Okay, but let's just hear him out. So one of the descriptions is God is without body. And he says, just so with nothing. So if you wanted to describe nothing, does, does something that is nothing have body? Well, no, right? Because it doesn't exist. So it wouldn't have body because a body is something physical. There's some shape, some substance there. So God is without body, just so with nothing. That's what he's saying. Then number two. He is without parts, so body parts, you know, and he says exactly so with nothing. Then he goes on, he is without circumference. And of course, he's going through the list of the articles of faith from uh, the doctrines of modern churches where they're describing God as without body parts, circumference, etc. right? So number three, he is without circumference. Precisely so with nothing. I mean, if, if something doesn't exist, there's no edge to it. There's, there's no point at which it stops, right? So if it is without circumference, precisely so with nothing is what D.W. Hull is saying. Number four, he is without center. Well, he says, where is the center of nothing? Well, obviously, the, the point there is there is no center of nothing. If it doesn't exist, it has no center. So if God is without center, that's the same as nothing, because where is the center of nothing? Number five, he is without locality. And then he says, well, just locate nothing, right? So that's the fifth similarity. And the sixth and final in his list, uh, the similarity between those of the modern churches or the doctrines of modern churches and those of infidels. He is not subject to passion, so to any kind of emotion, right? D.W. Hull says, can you give a more complete description of nothing? I think not. How much then are you ahead of the heathen? In other words, you're not ahead of the heathen. So he says, I think not. You can't give a better description of nothing or a more complete description of nothing. How much then are you ahead of the heathen? The heathen worship a real tangible God, you do not. And this is what D.W. Hull is saying here. Then he concludes by saying, in, in at least the section we're going to look at, right? He says, an atheist can join a church, 
with such articles of faith as these and not violate his views of God in the least. Because an atheist doesn't believe that God exists. So if God doesn't exist, there's no God, there's nothing there, right? There's, there's no God. And he says, this, these lists of six things here from the doctrines of modern churches, they're very similar to those of infidels, those of people who don't believe that God exists. And so he's showing that to say that God is without body, parts, circumference, center, locality, and passions, that's just describing nothing. Those are atheistic sentiments, okay? Now, there is another aspect here that I want to kind of talk about for a minute because I can imagine that somebody would read this and think, now, wait a minute. The heathen worship a real tangible God. Well, that's not good, right? We don't want to be like the heathen. And that's a realistic thing to wonder about because if, if you're just used to thinking that whatever the heathen do must be bad, then of course we wouldn't want to do what the heathen do, okay? But let's make sure that we really strive to understand what D.W. Hull is saying. He's not saying that we should worship heathen gods. That's not it at all. I mean, he's very clearly promoting the worship of the one true God, right? But the point he's making here is if you hold to these articles of faith where God doesn't have a body, God doesn't have parts, God doesn't have circumference, God doesn't have a center, God doesn't have locality, like he's literally everywhere present um, or even in multiple places at once because he doesn't have a definite locality. All of these things he's saying, that's not really being ahead of the heathen because at least the heathen worship a real tangible God and all these other things, they're the same as nothing. They're, they're like atheism. At least the heathen worship a real God. Now, again, there is a similarity here to what Ellen White taught. And as a reminder, Daniel Hull, D.W. Hull, came in in the 1850s, maybe later 1850s. And so this pillar doctrine had been established much earlier than that. And when he was brought into the movement, he learned these pillar doctrines. These weren't the doctrines being taught by other churches. These were specific for Seventh-day Adventists. And so anyway, um, here's a similarity between what D.W. Hall is saying and what Ellen White said. Because remember, she gave to the brethren and sisters what God showed to her. So this is from volume five, sorry, this is from volume three of the Spirit of Prophecy, page 47. And she says, Christ taught that God was a rewarder of the righteous and a punisher of the transgressor. He was not an intangible spirit, but a living ruler of the universe. Now for Ellen White to say that God is not an intangible spirit is to say that God is tangible, okay? Now, elsewhere, she also says, through Jesus Christ, God, not a perfume, not something intangible, but a personal God created man and endowed him with intelligence and power. Now, if we just change the color of some of the text on the screen, and make the other text stand out more obviously. Let's see what she's saying here. God was not an intangible spirit. Now, this is what Christ taught, right? Christ taught that God was not an intangible spirit, but a living ruler of the universe. And she says, God isn't a perfume. God isn't something intangible. God is a personal God. Now that tells us a couple of things. It tells us that she taught God is tangible. Okay. And by saying God is not something intangible, but a personal God, 
shows us what she meant by personal God. Notice there's nothing here that's tying the term personal God to something like how loving God is or or his benevolent character traits. She's specifically countering the idea that God is intangible with the truth that God is a personal God. So D.W. Hall taught that God is tangible and so did Ellen White. And, and I like how this also gives us some more insight into her use of the word personal. Okay, now let's return to this first article that we started looking at from D.W. Hall. And we've seen his usage of the word personage and elsewhere. Um, he uses the word personality when he says, well, if God was going to correct an error and deny his personality, you'd think it would be when Moses asked to see God and God didn't tell him he didn't have a face. He just said, you can't see my face and live. Okay. But he did show uh, Moses his back parts. Okay. Now in this article, I mentioned earlier that this was printed as two parts. So in the first article, um, that's what we looked at already. But then the next week he wrote the conclu- or they published the conclusion to this article. And at the end, after everything he's written, he says, we trust we have now fairly investigated this subject, having examined a majority of the scriptures referring to it. And again, the subject is on whether or not Christ is divine. That's the main topic here. But in showing what the Bible doctrine of the divinity of Christ is, he goes through and he explains the personality of God. Okay, so in so doing, he sums up by saying, hey, we trust by now we have fairly investigated this subject, having examined a majority of the scriptures referring to it. We have found positive testimony to show, number one, that God is a personal being. Now, of course, he lists some other things, but that's more designed to the main topic regarding the Bible doctrine of the divinity of Christ. But it's very noteworthy to see here, yet again, another example of how D.W. Hall used a variation of the word person. So after showing that God has a body and parts, that God is a personage, that he could have denied his personality to Moses, but he didn't. He actually showed him parts of his body. He sums up and says, we have found positive testimony to show that God is a personal being. And remember, Ellen White said that God is not something intangible, not a perfume, not something intangible, but God is a personal being. So they were both teaching that God is a tangible being, and they were both using the word person and experience to mean a tangible being with a body, parts, circumference, center, locality, passions, all the rest of it. And that the opposite view, the spiritualistic views, are atheistical in nature and the same as a view that any atheist could wholeheartedly agree to because it's the same as nothing. So this episode has been um, focused on D.W. Hull's use of the word person and its variants in regard to this pillar doctrine that is everything to us as a people, the personality of God. And Please come back for our next episode where we will be covering an article by George Amidon, and his name may be more familiar to some of you. I know several SEAs are familiar with the term uh, or with his name, George Amidon's name. We'll learn a little bit more about him, and we will see how did he use the word person and its variants when he was talking about what it means for God to be a person, something that is everything to us as a people. So I hope this has been a blessing and we will see you next time.